Everybody talks about prion-like diseases. Uh, now I want to spend uh, 10 minutes talking about real prions. <laughs> and uh, so um, three stories, uh, very quickly. Uh, I was planning to talk about prion replication, but after uh, uh, the talk by David Eisenberg, I think that I will more or less skip it or just mention that uh, uh, the idea of uh, poisoning uh, the prion amplification cycle has been around for a long time. And in fact, uh, some 20 years ago, we tried to use some dimeric versions of, uh, of the prion protein fused with immunoglobulin domains. And that worked actually pretty effectively in, uh, in mice. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, we also played around with ways to hyperstabilized fibers uh, here the idea was uh, that uh, fragmentation is actually very important because that is what creates uh, uh, further nuclei and uh, so we used uh, um, polythiophenes uh, to uh, essentially create a scaffold that would um, uh, hyperstabilize the fibers this uh, in fact works very well the protein SK resistance of such polythiophene treated prions uh, becomes astronomic uh, and uh, and yet they stop replicating and uh, uh, that is also something that I think may at some point uh, um, be translatable into some practical clinical application. But actually what uh, interests me more these days uh, is really what happens downstream because uh, for me it's still very hard to understand how it is that uh, in the end stoichiometrically you have very little PRP, PRP scraping in the brain and yet uh, this little amount uh, um, of protein is capable of wreaking havoc uh, immensely. I mean if you see the brain brain of a patient with a terminal Kreuzfeldt-Jakob disease, I mean, there, is, there are hardly any neurons left. There are huge vacuoles. It's a sponge for encephalopathy. So what is really going on? It looks like it must be something pretty specific because, uh, because certainly the, the pathological prions are extremely active as that. And if you look at the electron microscopy, one of the things that you see are these swollen neuronal processes. And you see that there are many membrane invaginations, there are set, some degenerating organelles uh, there, and, um, and this is really why these things are called spongiform encephalopathy, because uh, this vacuolation is so characteristic that the whole brain looks like a sponge. And uh, so, so I've been wondering what um, was my behind, uh, me behind this, and it uh, turns out that there is a phosphinositol kinase uh, that uh, is called PIK5 that uh, generates uh, phosphinositol 3,5-diphosphate, and this is a regulator of the size of endosomes and lysosomes. Uh, so that was a candidate, perhaps, for, um, uh, for, uh, uh, for this kind of uh, pathology, and it turns out that, indeed, if you, in, uh, if you infect mice uh, with prions, this is non-infectious brazen homogenous and RML6 is one of the uh, uh, canonical prion strains. And you see that what happens is that PIK5 is completely de depleted. And it's very specific. And PIK5 lives as a complex, as a ternary complex with two other proteins, PIK4 and VAC14. And nothing happens to them. It's just PIK5 that disappears. And the same thing happens also in patients with sporadic Kreuzfeldt-Jakob disease. And, uh, and it turns out that if you make a soluble analog of phosphinositol 35 diphosphate and uh you administer, for example, to cerebellar organotypic slices or even to, uh, to mice, you can, uh, you can actually suppress the vacuolation. This is actually the vacuoles in uh, infected cells. You see, again, non-infectious brain homogenate, uh, prion infection, you see a lot of vacuolation in cells, but you suppress it with the phosphinositol diphosphate. And also, uh, the, there is a huge lysosomal reaction. You see that all this lysosomal enzyme goes, go up like crazy crazy after, uh, after uh, prion infection, and all of this gets normalized uh, by giving the phosphinosal uh, uh, 3,5-diphosphate. So, uh, so really, the, the depletion of PIK5 is one of the things that uh, creates uh, this, uh, um, uh, this imbalance and induces the vacuoles so that you can actually suppress it by delivering the, the adduct, the reaction product of PIK5. And this actually um, motivated us to do a, a genome-wide uh, uh, a per a gene perturbation screen with a siren and a RAID screen uh, for, to identify everything that causes vacuoles in cells. And uh, uh, we are in the middle of this, but it's already pretty interesting. It turns out that uh, uh, there is a bunch of um, 
splicing uh, components of the spliceosome that uh, induce vacuos. And uh, in the meantime, we understand this uh, pretty well. It uh, turns out that, uh, um, that these are escort uh, components that, uh, that are uh, modified. Now, another point about, uh, so, so the depletion of peak 5 is pretty far downstream. Uh, but what happens at the membrane level when, when the pathological prion hits uh, the normal uh, resident uh, prion uh, protein that is a GPI anchor protein outside the cell? So it turns out uh, the, that the following happens. Uh, we have antibodies which I call prion mimetic because these antibodies, when they bind to the globular domain of the prion protein, they induce immediately a very rapid apoptotic response. Uh, and now one interesting thing is that this can be abolished uh, by co administration of antibodies against the N terminus. So from all this, uh, the hypothesis is that uh, the globular domain uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, some kind of regulatory domain, and the N terminus is really what drives toxicity. Now, um, but what happens? Why are these antibodies toxic? And uh, does this have anything to do with prion diseases? Well, it turns out uh, that, uh, and uh, this is the work of Kraft Fronsek that is just impressed now, and it turns out that actually what happens is that these two loops, uh, um, they are normally, in the normal situation, these two loops uh, the, within the prion protein are pretty far away, but these toxic antibodies, what they do is that they bring the two loops together and the hydrogen bond uh, is, uh, um, arises, as we call the, the hydrogen latch, and this hydrogen latch correlates with the toxicity of these antibodies. So in order to prove this, so this is actually the heavy chain of the antibody that comes in and that induces the conformational change. So uh, in order to test this, uh, we mutagenized, uh, we did an alanine scan of the heavy chain of these antibodies, and we found that there are variants of the antibodies that retain the, uh, the, um, the affinity for the antigen, but can no longer uh, rigidify this portion of the protein and uh, create this uh, hydrogen latch. And it turns out that these antibodies are, um, uh, are protective, and in fact, uh, uh, so, so in a way, you can, by a point mutation, uh, by a single point mutation, you can take a toxic antiprion antibodies and you can uh, uh, make it uh, you, you can make it innocuous. But then the, the, the really interesting thing is that these uh, th these point mutating antibodies prolong the life of prion infected mice. So we believe that this means that the mechanism by which these antibodies work is uh, um, um, related to, uh, to what happens in prion diseases. Uh, last point, uh, uh, the prion protein interacts with a bunch of G-protein couple receptors, and um, a couple of years ago we found actually that ADGRG6, which is a, um, an adhesion GPCR, is uh, the receptor for the normal prion protein. And this is involved in ma maintenance of peripheral myelin. But it turns out uh, that actually there is a bunch of more um, uh, uh, g, uh, um, g couple proteins uh, that interact with, uh, um, with, um, uh, with the prion protein. And uh, something that I'm got getting really excited about is GPR-133, this is still unpublished. And the GPR-133 is constitutively active but uh, uh, it, uh, the activity is downregulated by PRP. And here you see actually in hex cells uh, that are transfected with GPR-133, you see that there is a lot of cyclic AMP. But if you add PRP, you can actually suppress the activity of 133. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, you can uh, mitigate prion pathology by removing GPR-133. So again, so this is now a receptor which uh, we, has a good chance of being involved in uh, pathogenesis. Finally, and uh, this is just a one minute uh, shot, um, I think that we probably all agree that there is a dearth of targets. Uh, and uh, I feel it particularly painfully in the prion field. I think that we really, yeah, we have almost nothing, actually. We have only, because the human genetics has only uh, given us uh, the prion gene itself. Uh, there, uh, this has something to do with the rarity of the disease, but the fact is uh, the human gen genetics has been not very successful in the case of prions. So, so I decided that the only way to move forward here is really to utilize uh, the new genetic tools. Uh, and uh, uh, now everybody's doing CRISPR, CRISPR screens, but one of the problem with the CRISPR screens is that uh, uh, Pooled CRISPR screens are only useful if you have selectable phenotypes, if you can actually find 
Um, if you, for example, in cancer research, you can do uh, synthetic viability, synthetic lethality screens. This works very well. But in our case, uh, we often have to deal with complex morphological phenotypes or with things that you can only address with biochemical assays or even with non-cell autonomous phenotypes. And for that, pool screens cannot be done. So we have decided to uh, produce array libraries, and we made two, uh, two genome-wide array libraries. So we invented a way to clone plasmids very quickly, and we have cloned 42,000 plasmids, uh, encoding for, uh, um, uh, uh, so, so each plasmid has actually four guides, uh, and, uh, and they can be used as plasmids. You can make lentiviruses, and they also have a transposon element. And it turns out that if you link four non-overlapping uh, um, guide RNAs next to each other in this context, uh, you it can enhance the activity of CRISPR activator immensely, and uh, it's actually no comparison. And the same happens actually for um, uh, for uh, for knockout. So uh, we believe that this resource, which I really want to disseminate and want actually everybody to use, is uh, may really be a game changer for discovering an unbiased manner. Um, potential new targets uh, for neurodegeneration and for many other diseases. Uh, and the final thing that I just want to mention is that uh, when we planned this exercise, we wanted to do CRISPR knockout and CRISPR activation. Now, it turns out that for the CRISPR activator, uh, the guides are uh, uh, lo uh, they target the five prime promoter region of, um, of each gene. In the meantime, a paper has come out by Jonathan Wiseman showing that uh, a technology called CRISPR-Off, uh, with which you use a dead Cas9 uh, uh, fused to a methyl transferase, and this uh, methylates the promoter and switches off the gene. Well, it turns out, and we didn't know this when we started this, but it turns out that essentially 96% of our guys fall within the window for, uh, that is useful for CRISPR-Off. So, and uh, this is shown here, it works actually beautifully, so we can actually silence uh, genes uh, using the same library that is used for, uh, for activating the gene. And I'm particularly excited about this because uh, conventional CRISPR ablation does not work well uh, for iPSCs. And the reason is because uh, in iPSCs, if you do a, induce a double strand break, uh, you induce P53, which will kill the cell. So typically, uh, you don't end up with a viable cell. But uh, CRISPR methylation works actually very well. So these library are now completed. They have been quality controlled, and we're very happy to share them with the community. Thank you. Questions? Giovanni? Thank you. A very nice talk. I, I, want, I want to ask a question about the Big Five story. And uh, so, uh, how, does, how does the prion uh, protein influence the, the Big Five stability? What, what right. is the mechanism? So we have sorted it all out. Uh, I really don't have the ta uh, time to give you the whole uh, uh, picture, but it turns out that PIK5 is a palmitoylated protein. And uh, uh, so there are uh, acyl transferases that will uh, acylate PIK5. There are 21 acyl transferases in the human genome. We have tested all of them, and we have found two of them that actually acylate PIK5. It turns out uh, that upon prion infection, uh, there is um, uh, ER stress response uh, that uh, um, that grows, goes through PERC. And then something happens that is not entirely clear to me, but the result is that uh, the, uh, these two acyl transferases become delocalized. They are normally closed to the surface of the lysosomes. They become delocalized. As a result, PIK5 uh, becomes deacylated and, be, and it gets uh, proteasomally uh, degraded, and this is really how how things happen. So, so but there is um, something that we don't don't understand that goes from the ER stress uh, to the delocalization of the acyl transferases, and that is something we're working on now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the CRISPR libraries are super exciting. I just was wondering, kind of, how do you envision kind of the use of, of those? I mean, will it require kind of uh, a lot of kind of automation and system to screen? And what can you give I, a little bit more? It depends. I mean, I think that uh, uh, obviously uh, one thing that you can do is you can make. Uh, 
a pool library out of an array library, but you can also make mini pools. So, so something that we are exploring are pools of 10 genes each, which actually uh, uh, centers uh, the size of a genome wide screen from 20,000 to 2,000. Uh, and that is something that, uh, uh, that you can actually do with two students in four months. Uh, and I can assure you it works because we have done it. <laughs> Uh, right. So, can you relate the mechanism? So, it's Brad Hyman asking, can you relate the mechanism you presented with the clinical heterogeneity of various PRP associated disorders? Uh, yeah, that um, uh, so far, so far not. I think, uh, I, I think uh, it, it's an interesting point, but we are not there yet. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Is uh, PIC5 ne acting at neuronal or immune cell level? I mean, I know that many of these endosomal, lysosomal genes are also important uh, immune functions. So I was wondering if you think it was only targeting one versus the other important. So um, uh, yes, uh, uh, PIC5 uh, is involved in a number of um, uh, biological processes. And in fact, uh, there was a suggestion by Martin Kampman that actually PIC5 could be a, a target, that inhibition of PIC5 could be useful actually in Parkinson's. So based on what we are seeing here, I don't think this is a viable idea. Uh, but um, yeah. Uh, 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 so, uh, so far, we have mostly look, looked at the neuronal compartment, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think we, we can keep the discussion going for a few minutes. So if there are any questions or point to any of the speakers, raise your hand. Uh, Giovanni, have one more? Any other? I, I'm, uh, I'm again on big five, just to understand well the mechanism. So uh, do, do you get any um, internal vesicles in multivesicular bodies? when you get prion protein infection. So is, is this so strong that then, you know, you really destroy the, the mechanism uh, of, of, of uh, you know, escort machinery and whatever? You know, I think uh, I have been fascinated by these vacuoles for 30 years. And uh, they are so specific and so, uh, so prominent that I always thought uh, that they must tell us something about pathogenesis. In the, the, uh, if you look at the markers uh, that, are show, that uh, you can uh, see on, this, uh, on the membranes uh, um, delimiting the vacuoles, uh, these are all late endosomes, uh, lysosomal markers. Uh, and uh, so, so I'm pretty convinced uh, that, um, uh, that, uh, that this is the genesis. But the fact is that uh, actually they are not so super specific. I mean, in Alzheimer's, there is something called the granular vacuolar degeneration uh, that, uh, that is very similar to, um, um, to the vacuolation you see in prions. And there are also diseases uh, like, for example, uh, um, inclusion body my myopathy also creates vacuoles in the um, uh, muscle fibers. And uh, obviously, I am uh, wondering whether uh, this type of pathologies uh, may also be uh, due to um, uh, derangement of PIC5 activity. Mm -hmm. 